Okay, I'd like to show you uh, an interesting phenomenon that happens to a particular type of differential equation, um, spe specifically um, a boundary value problem um, where the differential equation has a certain form. So let me just write down uh, the differential equation that I'm interested in. So it's going to be y double prime uh, plus lambda y is equal to zero. Um, and I'm going to give some boundary values. Uh, so let's just say y at zero is equal to zero and y at some other uh, non-zero uh, point, I'm just going to call it L, uh, is also equal to zero. So essentially, after solving this, I want to make sure that uh, my value of my function at zero is equal to zero, my value at some other point L is equal to zero. Uh, so these are kind of uh, thought of as boundary values uh, that, that in some way at, at the boundaries of my function, I want them to be zero. You can kind of think of it that way. Anyway, to solve this, um, it's not going to be anything uh, too tricky, but we are going to have to analyze a few different cases. Um, we don't know what lambda is. Um, obviously, the, the solution y equals 0 solve this, solves this, because if y equals 0, um, certainly y at 0 is 0, y at l is 0, um, the second derivative is 0, and if y is 0, then that makes 0 equals 0. So certainly uh, y equals zero, equals 0 is a solution. Uh, but the question is, are there any other solutions? Um, are there any other lambda values that allow this to have a solution? So uh, let's go take a uh, look at the possible values for lambda where there might be a different solution, and let's then go try to find them. So let's just take the first case. What if lambda was equal to 0? Uh, well, then our differential equation lo would look like y double prime is equal to zero. And if y double prime is equal to zero, um, that's just saying find me a, a function whose second derivative is equal to zero. Um, one would be y equals mx plus b, so just a straight line. Um, and then what we do is if we actually uh, plug in our um, conditions here, y at zero, um, we plug in zero, that would give us y equals equal to b y at 0 is 0 means that b has to be equal to 0 and y at l um, after b is 0 if we plug in l we get y is equal to ml and if y, uh, that is supposed to be 0 then that must imply that m is also 0 uh, which means our function is just y is equal to 0 so that's not really interesting that we already had that one um, so let's take a look at an, another uh, situation how about lambda is less than zero. So how about some uh, negative lambda values? Well, if we want to ensure that lambda is negative, we can write um, lambda as negative alpha alpha squared, where alpha is some real number. Of course, a real number squared will give us um, a positive number, and then we stick this negative on front. That'll ensure that um, lambda is always negative. OK, so if I know that lambda is always negative, um, then we can uh, write our auxiliary equation as m squared uh, minus alpha squared is equal uh, minus alpha squared is equal to zero, which means m is equal to positive or negative alpha, which means our uh, general solution is y is equal to c1 e to alpha x plus c2 e to negative alpha x. Okay, so uh, that's our general solution. Let's just figure out. Uh, what c1 and c2 have to be to satisfy these conditions. So if I want y of 0 to equal 0, well, when I plug in y of 0 into my function, I get that c1 plus c2. And if I want that to equal 0, that must mean that c1 has got to be equal to negative c2. All right, no problem. That means my function now looks like um, y is equal to uh, c1 e to the alpha x minus e to the negative alpha x. Okay, the next thing uh, is to apply the other condition. So y at l, if I use y at l in my new um, solution here, I have c1 times e to the alpha l minus e to the negative alpha l. And I want that to equal zero. That gives me two choices. Either c1 is equal to zero which again would just give me y is equal to zero. Um, very not interesting. Uh, that would just give me y is equal to zero as my solution. Or I need that e to the alpha l is equal to uh, e to the negative alpha l. 
taking the logarithm of both sides, I have alpha L is equal to negative alpha L. And the only way that can happen is if L is equal to zero or alpha is equal to zero, which is impossible. The reason it's not possible is because we assumed uh, that alpha was some non-zero number because if it was zero then lambda would be zero and we already talked about that up in our first case and uh, L is equal to zero we already said that L is some non-zero other point um, so here we again come to the conclusion that if lambda is smaller than zero we either have uh, well the only solution that can come out of this is if y is equal to zero so uh, now that we've looked at those two uh, conditions, let's look at another one, or the, th the third and final one, and that is what if lambda is greater than zero? So let's look at this case. If lambda is greater than zero, we can again do the same thing. We can say that lambda is equal to alpha squared, which makes our differential equation y double prime plus alpha squared uh, y is equal to zero. And if we look at the auxiliary solution of this, we have that m squared plus alpha squared is equal to zero, which means the solutions are m is equal to positive or negative alpha times the imaginary unit i. Okay, uh, knowing that, that means that our solution, our general solution is C1 um, sine alpha x plus C2 cos alpha x. So this is our general solution. Okay, let's, let's apply the uh, boundary conditions. Uh, so y at zero means, uh, when we plug in y equals zero into our case, uh, plugging y into zero gives me sine of zero, which is zero. It ends up uh, being C2. When I plug in x equals zero, that gives me cos of zero, which is one. So that just gives me C2. Now I want that to be equal to zero, which forces C2 to be zero. So now I know that my solution actually just looks like C1 sine of alpha x. And now the next question is, what could uh, C1 possibly be? Okay, so the next thing that I want to do for C1 to figure what C1 could possibly be is I'm going to plug in our other boundary condition, namely L. So if I look at y of L, I plug it into my new solution, I get that C1 uh, of sine alpha L has to be equal to zero, because that's what we want it to be. Um, there's two questions here. There's two ways to do this. Either C1 is equal to zero, which again leads me to Y is equal to zero, which I don't want. Or the other condition that is possibly true is that sine of alpha L is equal to zero. Now this uh, can definitely happen. Uh, and the way that this would happen, uh, if you take a look at this, is if alpha L is actually equal to an integer value of pi. So uh, 0 pi, 1 pi, 2 pi, etc. Now we don't want, um, so if we actually solve this, then we get um, alpha is equal to n pi over L. Now if n is equal to 0, that would give us alpha equals 0, which would give us lambda is equal to 0, which we already talked about. So we can't let n be 0. If n is a negative number, um, that can be okay as well. So what we're going to do is we are going to then say uh, that n is any non-zero integer. So if n is any non-zero integer um, and alpha happens to be n times pi over l, what that'll actually allow us to do is have a solution uh, to this boundary value problem. So the solution ends up being, the solution ends up being y is equal to uh, c1 sine um, n pi over l and the only possible values for lambda that allow this to happen is well remember that lambda was equal to alpha squared and we just figured out the only possible alphas that will make this uh, this solution non-zero um, which was n squared pi squared over L. So you have this kind of weird behavior where the only um, possible values for lambda that would allow this um, particular problem to have non-zero solutions are when uh, lambda are inter integer values of um, n, so n squared times pi squared over L, um, 
And the solutions are also kind of these discrete, um, you have an infinite different number of solutions depending on what you choose for n. Uh, so as long as you choose an integer value for n, you have all these kind of allowable lambdas. So you have all these different types of uh, values that lambda can be. And with them you have a whole bunch of different types of solutions. Uh, usually these solutions are denoted by n uh, because you kind of have this parameter n in here. Uh, these are called eigenfunctions and these are called eigenvalues. So I just wanted to make a quick little video uh, kind of glossing over some of the details but at the end of the day just a kind of a simple uh, demonstration of why uh, this particular differential equation has these, this kind of interesting property where only certain values of lambda will actually allow you to get non-zero solutions. And these certain values of lambdas are called eigenvalues and the solutions that uh, correspond with each eigenvalue is called an eigenfunction.